Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Blogatos. I am Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible Truth series, we go through the Word together, chapter and verse. And we are closing in on the end of Second Chronicles, getting close. We're, you know, not quite there just yet. And we're in uh, Chronicles 35, and this is continuing the reign of Josiah, which was the last good king of the southern kingdom. At this time, the northern kingdom's already been carried away. Um, there's just people that have been deported there from the very various nations that Assyria had conquered, and they have deported them into the land. And um, so there's just kind of a remnant left uh, in the northern kingdom. Some of them love God, some of them don't. And in the southern kingdom, you've got this revival going on under King Josiah that lasted a total of 31 years because that's the length of his reign. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for, I thank you for Josiah. I think that, thank you that he was a wonderful example of someone who uh, gave his life to you wholeheartedly and would not turn to the right or to the left. He wouldn't deviate, um, but he stayed the course until the very end. And, um, you know, I mean, he was human. He, uh, he had uh, that, that flaw of, of rushing in headlong into a battle that he shouldn't have joined in, but that doesn't mean that his heart was not loyal to you because we see that it was. And so I thank you, Father, that you are with us to help us uh, in times of trouble and that you, you work all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. I thank you for these things. I thank you for all those who, who tune in here with me, who belong to Jesus, who are called according to your purpose. Um, I ask that you bless their way, help them to do what they're supposed to be doing now in this time. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so Second uh, Chronicles 35. I don't think that I have anything highlighted out here. Um, if, I, if I come across something, I'll let you know. But uh, according to our, our handy-dandy green bookmark here, as soon as we finish chapter 35, we'll uh, look over to Jeremiah chapter 22 and uh, probably end up reading chapter, you know, that chapter more than once because we'll probably hit it when we go through Jeremiah because I feel like we should do Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Important to note because this is, Josiah is the last good king and it's right before him that then they get uh, exiled to Babylon. And, so to go back and to look in the prophet Jeremiah, uh, he prophesied before about them being carried away. Um, and then but he himself, uh, through the circumstances that he encountered, ended up being, being staying behind, not being carried away. Um, and then his counterpart, Ezekiel, uh, was, was carried away into Babylon. And so you have these two guys prophesying at the same time, one to the remnant that was left behind, and it was not a good remnant, and one... Uh, prophesying to the majority that was carried away off into Babylon, and so um, you know you might you might wonder you know why why does the Bible deal so much with this uh, with that eventual exile into Babylon and then the redemption of God's you know where He de redeemed His people back to the land? It's because it has end time implications and very very um, strong overtones concerning the end times, and so God wrote these things down for us as a a foreshadow, a blueprint, if you will. Uh, things aren't going to follow exactly the same pattern, but the motives that drive humanity remain the same. And so we'll see in the end times, humanity get to a point where they're either going to, every person on the planet is either going to accept Christ or they're going to go the other way. And those who go the other way, eventually will get it to a point where they'll allow the Antichrist into power. You know, and I mean, of course, he, he can't, he, 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 we see in the word he fails to make the whole one world order thing that everyone thinks he's going to be able to do. Um, and there's, you know, we won't get into that. I mean, we've talked about it before in the past. So for our purposes now, let's just jump into Second Chronicles chapter 35. So the good king Josiah is still reigning. Verse 1, it says, Then Josiah announced that the Passover of the Lord would be celebrated in Jerusalem. And so the Passover lamb was slaughtered on the 14th day of the first month. Josiah also assigned the priests to their duties and encouraged them in their work at the temple of the Lord. He issued this order to the Levites, who were to teach all Israel, and who had been set apart to serve the Lord. Put the holy ark in the temple that was built by Solomon, son of David, the king of Israel. You no longer need to carry it back and forth on your shoulders. Now spend your time serving the Lord your God and his people Israel. Report for duty according to the family divisions of your ancestors, following the directions of King David of Israel and the directions of his son Solomon. Then stand in the sanctuary at the place appointed for your family division and help the families assigned to you as they bring their offerings to the temple. Slaughter the Passover lambs, purify yourselves, and prepare to help those who come. Follow all the directions that the Lord gave through Moses. 
Then Josiah provided 30,000 lambs and young goats for the people's Passover offerings, along with 3,000 cattle, all from the king's own flocks and herds. The king's officials also made willing contributions to the people, priests, and Levites. Hilkiah, Zechariah, and Jehiel, the administrators of God's temple, gave the priests 2,600 lambs and young goats and 300 cattle as Passover offerings. The Levite leaders, Conaniah and his brothers Shemaiah and Nethanel, as well as Hashabiah, Jehiel, and Josabad, gave 5,000 lambs and young goats and 500 cattle to the Levites for their Passover offerings. So they're helping the people to worship by providing them um, with offerings to the Lord. And so, uh, verse 10, when everything was ready for the Passover celebration, the priests and the Levites took their places, organized by their divisions, as the king had commanded. The Levites then slaughtered the Passover lambs and presented the blood to the priests, who sprinkled the blood on the altar while the Levites prepared the animals. They divided the burnt offerings among the people by their family groups, so they could offer them to the Lord as prescribed in the Law of Moses. They did the same with the cattle. Then they roasted the Passover lambs as prescribed, and they boiled the holy offerings in pots, kettles, and pans, and brought them out quickly so the people could eat them. And, you know, um, so the Passover lamb, of course, represents Jesus. And uh, that was the entry point of the covenant with the, uh, that God made with the people. Before he ever gave them the laws and decrees at Mount Sinai, they ate the Passover lamb. They celebrated the Passover uh, before uh, God delivered them out of Egypt. It was that night. And then the next morning, that was when Pharaoh was like, get out. We don't want you here anymore. And so they left with God's help. And so, but God, before then, God had said, if there's any strangers or foreigners living among you, and they want to join in the Lord's Passover, let them come near, you know, to be to become uh, Jews, become Israelites. And so uh, this is a reaffirming, if you will, every time it would celebrate the Passover, it was a reaffirming of their covenant, the entry point of their covenant with God. And it was through um, the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. Jesus is our Passover lamb. And so then every time that you, um, you know, when you first said out loud that Jesus was your Lord, and you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You were saved. That was the entry point into the family of God. You know, but every time afterwards that you confess that Jesus is Lord is sort of like that remembrance that they would do every year where they would they would uh, have the Passover meal again. And so uh, I remember, you know, one time listening to Brother Hagen or talk about it. Actually, I think it was one of his books I was reading. Where he, yeah, it was a book where he was talking about uh, the confession of our faith. The word says, hold fast the confession of your faith. And he said, well, what's the, what's the you know, and really there's many confessions of your faith. What are you believing God for right now? You know, but, um, you know, along that line, he made the observation that, you know, the first confession of our faith that we could ever make was that we, that Jesus was Lord. So the word said in, in, um, in Romans, that if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you believe in your heart, God's risen him from the dead, then you'll be saved. And so every time that you make that con confession that Jesus is Lord, you are reaffirming the confession of your faith you're holding fast the confession of your faith and it serves to strengthen the bond that you have with the lord and this is what they were to do they were to uh take this passover uh, meal seriously every year because it was a reminder to them of the covenant that they had with god if they had done that if they had paid attention to the signs that god put in place to remind them of of, uh, of the, their relationship with him then they would never have uh, oscillated back and forth between uh, the paganism and, and, and God, and they wouldn't have ended up being uh, banished to Babylon or exiled to Babylon. I mean. And so, <clears throat> uh, you know, because Jesus is the Passover lamb, we don't do these offerings, these sacrifices that they did in the Old Testament anymore because it's not necessary. Jesus took care of all that for us. In fact, that God said in, in the book of Hebrews that it, he, he didn't desire these types of, of sacrifices. Um, they were just in place temporarily until the time was fulfilled for Jesus to come and because the Bible says he came at just the right time, we don't understand the fullness of uh, understanding of that because it's not for us to know at this time, but we will know uh, at some point. I mean, we will know after Jesus comes back. Uh, so verse 14, afterward, the Levites prepared Passover offerings for themselves and for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, because the priests had been busy from morning till night offering the burnt offerings and the fat portions. The Levites took responsibility for all these preparations. The musicians, descendants of Asaph, were in their assigned places following the commands that had been given by David, Asaph, Heman, and Jejethon, the king's seer. The gatekeepers guarded the gates and did not need to leave their posts of duty, for their Passover offerings were prepared for them by their fellow Levites. So they were brought their portions while they were on duty. It's very helpful to each other. Very good. Verse 16. 
The entire ceremony, ceremony for the Lord's Passover was completed that day. All the burnt offerings were sacrificed on the altar of the Lord, as King Josiah had commanded. All the Israelites presented in, present in Jerusalem excuse me, celebrated Passover and the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. Never since the time of the prophet Samuel had there been such a Passover. None of the kings of Israel had ever kept a Passover as Josiah did, involving all the priests and Levites, all the people of Jerusalem, and people from all over Judah and Israel. This Passover was celebrated in the 18th year of Josiah's reign. After Josiah had finished restoring the temple, King Necho of Egypt led his army up from Egypt to do battle at Karshemish on the Euphrates River, and Josiah and his army marched out to fight him. But King Necho sent messengers to Josiah with this message. What do you want with me, king of Judah? I have no quarrel with you today. I am on my way to fight another nation, and God has told me to hurry. Do not interfere with God who is with me, or he will destroy you. Now this is interesting. So um, what happens, it, now it said that he completed the everything there at the 18th year of his reign, but it says that he reigned 31 years. So that means between this verse here, where it says this, that last verse, verse 19, this Passover was celebrated in the 18th year of Josiah's reign, from that Passover to verse 20, after he'd finished restoring the temple, King Necho of Egypt and his army came up. Now this is the battle in which Josiah dies. That means that there is, uh, see that's it was the 18th year of his reign, and so it would be 13 years between this Passover that we just read about and this battle between the, uh, Josiah and the king of Egypt. And so that means then that you had 13 years of revival still after that Passover. Okay, so uh, Necho was telling him, God's the one that sent me on this errand. And so once again, here is the principle of God uh, sending, um, there's, there's a, a wicked nation and God is, is using the king of Egypt to bring judgment upon it. Okay, and that doesn't mean that the king of Egypt serves God. It just means that he has realized somehow by some revelation, okay, the God of Israel has commanded me to go take care of this. And the God did the same thing with Assyria. He did the same thing with Babylon. You know, there's other, other nations. You can read history. There's other nations throughout the world that this kind of thing has happened where God uses one nation to bring judgment against another one if that nation is doing wickedly where it gets to a point. In other words, where it gets to a point where it is causing more harm in the earth than it is good. Okay, so... <clears throat> Uh, Necho is saying, because God has sent me on this errand, he has sanctioned me to do this. If you try to stand against me, you will not succeed. And he's right. So it says, verse 22, but Josiah refused to listen to Necho, to whom God had indeed spoken. And he would not turn back. Instead, he disguised himself and led his army into battle on the plain of Megiddo. But the enemy archers hit King Josiah with their arrows and wounded him. He cried out to his men, take me from the battle, for I am badly wounded. So they lifted Josiah out of his chariot and placed him in another chariot. Then they brought him back to Jerusalem where he died. So this is just tragic, you know, um, because he's a good king. You hate to see him him die before his time. And by see, it's because he won't listen. And I don't know, I mean, is it because he was just just assumed that God wouldn't speak to Pharaoh? Don't know, Didn't doesn't say. But what we do know is that he, at least he did that word to the point where he real, where he was like, well, maybe if I disguise myself and go into the battle, I won't, uh, you know, I, um, it'll come out okay. Now, the problem with that is you see a parallel that happened back with King Ahab, and that, that who was a wicked king of the northern kingdom, when Ahab and Jehoshaphat went into battle um, up to Ramoth Gilead. And uh, the prophet Micaiah said, uh, if you go up, then you're going to die. But Ahab was like, okay, well, I'm going to go up and I'm going to get to the battle. I'm going to disguise myself. And he went into battle and a random archer, same thing, randomly hit him and he died. And the same thing happened here to King Josiah. So the 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 method by which they died, um, you know, can you say, well, was God the one that caused it to happen? You can say that that occurred within his permissive will. In other words, he allowed it to happen. Was it his perfect will? No, not necessarily. And so, did God want Josiah to die? No. In fact, God probably wanted Josiah to heed the word of, of uh, the king of Egypt in this case, but he wouldn't do it. And so, what we can do then is we can say, okay, same, same, very similar circumstances. Both went into a battle they knew they shouldn't have gone into. Both disguised themselves. Both got hit by a random arrow and both died as a result. One was a wicked king. One was a good king. So you can say, okay, the method has nothing to do with whether that, with with um, their lives. 
and the life that they lived and the witness that they carried has not the method by which they died had nothing to do with that it was just something that happened as a result of neither one of them listening to the word that was spoken and and going out and really going against their better judgment seeing as how they both were like well there was something that made them say well let me disguise myself before i go into battle not a good idea we shouldn't try to get around something that we know god has told us by um you know bringing in our own measures you know taking our own measures and and applying our own methods and ways of okay well maybe if i do this i can kind of you know no no if, if god gives us a definite don't do this we should not do it and so uh verse 25 or like uh, verse 24 still sorry the last sentence there he was buried there in the world cemetery and all judah and jerusalem mourned for him the prophet jeremiah composed funeral songs for josiah and to this day choirs still sing these sad songs about his death these songs of sorrow have become a tradition and are recorded in the book of laments the rest of the events of Josiah's reign and his acts of devotion, carried out according to what was written in the law of the Lord, from beginning to end, are recorded in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. Okay, so now we'll go over and look at um, Jeremiah chapter 22. And once again, I'll mention, because we're using these bookmarks in tandem, you can order the pair of these bookmarks together uh, to help in your study of the word. And we'll send them to you free of charge. You know, you can just, just got to let us know. Just email us in the email that, uh, address that's in the description of this video. We'll be happy to send that to you. And so in Jeremiah chapter 22, so Jeremiah is speaking. And this is during the reign of um, a son of Josiah. And so we're kind of peeking ahead a little bit. We, you know, uh, just, but, but it's about King, a, a lot of it has to do with King Josiah and sort of the, aftermath slash you know um uh coattails of his reign and a, f a false perception that arose because of the success that josiah had because we see a lot of times people do that these days you know a church a famous church leader might fall and people lose their faith as a result but it's like it, it, it he he's he she they're just a they're just a human you know they're they're not yeah maybe god used them mightily but that doesn't mean that they are god you know, and so I think we a lot of times we we get our perceptions messed up and we think uh, we we get to where we're following the persona or the success rather than following God, who is the source of the success, because at any time someone might choose to turn against their faith and and just um, or, or, you know, harbor some some, um, you know, secret sin that they're that they're living in the shadows, but they're but they're they've got a different persona when they're out uh, out in front of the people and and so um the reason i'm bringing that up is because it's like this uh this principle of uh false perceptions surrounding a very successful person because josiah was a very successful king even though he died abruptly uh, overall he was a very good king and so here in chapter 22 of jeremiah it says this is what the lord said to me Go over and speak directly to the king of Judah. Now, this is the this is not King Josiah, but this is one of his sons. Say to him, listen to this message from the Lord, you king of Judah, sitting on David's throne. Let your attendants and your people listen too. This is what the Lord says. Be fair-minded and just. Do what is right. Help those who have been robbed. Rescue them from their oppressors. Quit your evil deeds. Do not mistreat foreigners, orphans, and widows. Stop murdering the innocent. If you obey me, there will always be a descendant of David sitting on the throne here in Jerusalem. The king will ride through the palace gates and chariots and on horses with his parade of attendants and subjects. But if you refuse to pay attention to this warning, I swear by my own name, says the Lord, that this place will become a pile of rubble. So now this is interesting because in the previous episode we saw where God said that that prophecy of calamity that was going to come upon judah and jerusalem and they were going to be carried away to babylon he said this is not going to happen during your lifetime josiah but it will happen later on but yet we see that grace being extended even to one of josiah's sons where god's like look if you stop sinning if you just do what i tell you to do you won't that won't have to happen you, you can continue to to reign as kings in here in in this land that i gave you but they, they won't listen so verse six now this is what the lord says concerning judah's royal palace I love you as much as fruitful Gilead and the green forests of Lebanon, but I will turn you into a desert with no one living within your walls. I will call for wreckers who will bring out their tools to dismantle you. 
They will tear out all your fine cedar beams and throw them on the fire. People from many nations will pass by the ruins of this city and say to one another, Why did the Lord destroy such a great city? And the answer will be, Because they violated their covenant with the Lord their God by worshiping other gods. Do not weep for the dead king or mourn his loss. Instead, weep for the captive king being led away, for he will never return to see his native land again. So what is he talking about? The dead king, King Josiah, the king that everyone was mourning for. We just we just read about it. That Everyone was mourning for him. They composed funeral songs for him. Why? Because he was such an awesome king, and he led the people to great success. But but God issues this this warning now to the, uh, the, the king who's coming up, who's going to act wickedly, and he's saying, if you do what's right, I'll take care of you the same as I took care of your father. Essentially, that's what he's saying. But he knows he's not going to listen. So he says, don't weep for the dead king or mourn his loss. Instead, weep for the captive king being led away. For he will never again, or excuse me, he will never return to see his native land again. For this is what the Lord says about Jehoahaz, who succeeded his father, King Josiah, and was taken away as a captive. He will never return. He will die in a distant land and will never again see his own country. And so that's the first king that succeeded Josiah was carried away. And then one of the other sons uh, took, but they were both wicked kings. One of the other sons took over. And, and, and the Lord says, verse 13, What sorrow awaits Jehoiakim, that was, it, that was the one who succeeded his brother, who builds his palace with forced labor. He builds injustice into its walls, for he makes his neighbors work for nothing. He does not pay them for their labor. He says, I will build a magnificent palace with huge rooms and many windows. I will panel it throughout with fragrant cedar and paint it a lovely red. But a beautiful cedar palace does not make a great king. Your father, Josiah, also had plenty to eat and drink, but he was just and right in all his dealings. That is why God blessed him. He gave justice and help and help to the poor and needy, and everything went well for him. Isn't that what it means to know me, says the Lord? Wow. But you... You have eyes only for greed and dishonesty. You murder the innocent, oppress the poor, and reign ruthlessly. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about Jehoiakim, son of King Josiah. The people will not mourn for him, crying to one another, Alas, my brother, alas, my sister. His subjects will not mourn for him, crying, Alas, our master is dead, alas, his splendor is gone. He will be buried like a dead donkey, dragged out of Jerusalem and dumped outside the gates. Weep for your allies in Lebanon. Shout for them in Bashan. Search for them in the regions east of the river. See, they are all destroyed. No one is left to help you. So why why is it God saying this now about his allies? Because he's trusting in his allies to rescue him rather than God. And God's like, the, the human help is useless. Verse 21, I warned you when you were prosperous, but you reply, don't bother me. You have been that way since childhood. You simply will not obey me. God has been speaking to this man since childhood. And he's still not listening. Verse 22. And now the winds will blow away your allies. All your friends will be taken away as captives. Surely, then you will see your wickedness and be ashamed. It may be nice to live in a beautiful palace paneled with wood from the cedars of Lebanon, but soon you will groan with pangs of anguish, anguish like that of a woman in labor. As surely as I live, says the Lord, I will abandon you, Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Even if you were the signet ring on my right hand, I would pull you off. I will hand you over to those who seek to destroy you, those you so desperately fear, to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and the mighty Babylonian army. I will expel you and your mother from this land, and you will die in a foreign country, not in your native land. You will never again return to the land you yearn for. Why is this man Jehoiachin like a discarded broken jar? Why are he and his children to be exiled to a foreign land? O oh, earth, 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 listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Let the record show that this man Jehoiachin was childless. He was a failure, for none of his children will succeed him on the throne of David to rule over Judah. So was he physically childless? No, but he did not have a child who would continue to reign from the throne of, of, uh, of Judah because of what had happened. So... God's like, if you would do what I said, you would always have a king on the throne to reign in the line of David. But they wouldn't listen to him. And so it's so interesting, you know, you see these correlations in scripture because in verse 10, it's like, do not do not weep for the dead king or mourn his loss. Instead, weep for the captive king being led away, you know. And so, um, you know, it reminds me of when Jesus was 
carrying his cross on on the way and the the women were mourning for you know they were crying and weeping for me he said don't weep for me he's like weep for what's coming to jerusalem you know and so jesus was is is a king who did not remain dead <laughs> like josiah did you know and it's interesting because jesus humanly speaking is a part of this very line of kings that we're talking about this wicked king that god is bringing this judgment against is the humanly speaking one of the ancestors of jesus but all of the good kings were too and so it's just very interesting to uh to look at this and see you know but the motives the motives are the same you know the people who um you know these days thank you the people who these days charge unfair rent and you know it's very similar to this idea that he's saying you you know you're 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 bringing forced labor and you're building your palace and you're not paid paying the people any wages you know he's withholding um the you know the the workman's hire and jesus said the workman is worthy of his hire you know and so we need to be good stewards then of i mean you know you, you hire someone to 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 fix one of your appliances make sure you pay him fairly you know, I mean, this is how we can apply this here, you know, um, you know, uh, pay a fair amount. You know, it doesn't matter if the times are bad, you know, I mean, uh, be a good steward, uh, you know, check your motives and treat people right. That's what God was saying. If you treat these people right, you know, I'll take care of you, you know, because it's treating people right, you know, helping the oppressed, the poor, the widows, the people who can't pay you back. You know, uh, Jesus said that's the same. As often as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So this is how God sees these things. You know, so he, that's why he said, that's why he said right here. Um, <clears throat> he, he, he's talking about King Josiah and why he was so successful. He says in verse 15, your father Josiah also had plenty to eat and drink, but he was just and right in all his dealings. That is why God blessed him. He gave justice and help to the poor and needy and everything went well for him isn't that what it means to know me says the lord so to you know do for people who can't help you in return and to be blessed as a result is to know god you know um it, to to understand his heart and his motives and why he gives us the directives that he does so anyway god's awesome let's go ahead and pray Father, I thank you uh, for your goodness and your mercy. I thank you, Father, your long suffering. Uh, and you do give warnings to your people and you want us to succeed. You want us to do well. And the only way to do that is to follow your ways and do what's pleasing in your sight. I ask that you help us all to do that, Father. And in Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. Well, bless you guys, and we will see you again.